Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Up to $26,000 per employee? They call it the 15-minute refund, but it's not a gimmick. It's for business owners who stuck it out during the pandemic. The Employee Retention Tax Credit, or ERTC. But time is running out to get started. Talk to the experts. JWC Advisors at iHeartTaxRefunds.com. Who are they? CPAs who will keep you on the right side of the IRS. So do it the right way. Go to iHeartTaxRefunds.com. That's iHeartTaxRefunds.com. Oscast. Hello world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. In June of 2019, things took a sharp turn for the worst in the strategically important Gulf region. Two oil tankers were attacked by assailants unknown and a sophisticated US RQ-4A Global Hawk drone was shot down. No one was killed in these attacks and the damage to the ships in question was minimal. All fingers pointed at Iran being the culprit for the tanker attacks in spite of Iranian denials. What was far clearer was the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps' culpability for the destruction of the US drone. After all, this took place set against the backdrop of America's maximum pressure policy against the Islamic Republic of Iran, a longtime enemy of the United States. The previous Obama administration, mindful of the potential instabilities and dire consequences of taking on Iran militarily over its nuclear ambitions, attempted diplomacy to bring Iran in from the cold. This diplomatic engagement, complex as it was, brought about the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JAKPOA, whereby Iran's nuclear developments could be verifiably halted, with a quid pro quo being rolling back crippling economic sanctions imposed on Iran. JAKPOA involved the UN Security Council's Permanent Five, the US, UK, France, Russia, the People's Republic of China and Germany. When Jakpoa was brought into being in 2015, it was hailed as a lasting Obama-era legacy. Except for those hawks within the Washington Beltway, especially among the Republican Party, who hated Obama's liberal policies and his slippery position over Syria. Trump's 2016 presidential campaign made clear his hatred of all things about the Obama legacy, especially Jakpoa, which he called a bad deal. In May of 2018, the Trump administration walked away from Jakpoa, perplexing and angering other participants in the deal, especially the Iranians. Trump increased economic sanctions on Iran, including closing off all of the country's avenues for legally selling its oil, the Iranian regime's only revenue-raising commodity. This has hit the Islamic Republic hard. So two months after the mysterious attacks on the international oil tankers and the U.S. drone shootdown last June, in September, two of Saudi Arabia's significant oil facilities were hit at Quraysh and Abqaiq. This attack temporarily shut down 5% of Saudi Arabian oil exports, showing the world how quickly things could internationalize in the Gulf were war to break out. Iran's Houthi rebels claimed responsibility for these attacks as revenge for ongoing Saudi military intervention in Yemen, but the attacks looked far too sophisticated to have been launched by the Houthi, long regarded as a key Iranian proxy. Furthermore, questions were raised about the state of Saudi air defenses, Riyadh having invested billions in high-tech U.S. Patriot anti-aircraft anti-ballistic missile systems. And right next door to Saudi Arabia in Bahrain is the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet headquarters, with all its space-based technology, and no one saw the attack coming. To explore these peculiar strategic manoeuvrings and what they may mean, we are joined today from the UK by Commodore Patrick J. Tyrrell, OBE, Royal Navy Retired, Chairman of SIA's Advisory Board and SIA's Senior Non-Resident Fellow, Global and Maritime Security. Also in the studio are David Olney and Tim Whiffen. 
Before we start today's episode, I would like to remind listeners that Strategicon can be found on the Ozcast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and on the Sage International Australia website, www.sageinternational.org.au. Pat, thank you very much for joining us. One of the things that I'd like to start off with is by saying that we'll just have a general conversation with regard to the whole breakdown of relations between the US and Iran and looking at it from a more hardcore security aspect, where it's all going to go. Do you foresee a greater conflagration around the corner? So perhaps what we can do is we can start off by saying, well, Donald Trump seems to be a bit of a anti-war peacenik, really, because he did have a chance not that long ago to strike out at Iran with regard to the shooting down of the uh, US uh, Global Hawk drone. Why do you think he pulled the strike 10 minutes before the ordinance was released? Well, perhaps um, I might open up here. I think I think you're right. Trump has always been not anti-war, but um, can't see its value in commercial terms. I mean, uh, his commercial experience... Uh, is not in the armaments trade, you know. He he's uh, not uh, um, really concerned. I mean, he's more worried that people might get hurt. He's uh, uh, he was somebody who managed to avoid the Vietnam draft. Um, I think spurs on his feet was the um, uh, was was the reason that was given, um, and so he's always been slightly uh, again it. Um, but he likes talking big, and that's the problem. You know, if you're going to enter into negotiations carrying a big stick, history tells you you do occasionally have to use the big stick to make people take notice of you. Uh, as a military person, though, Pat, I mean, what do you think of a president who chooses to rattle the saber in the way that Donald Trump had done? Does it mean that uh, he, because he can't follow through, the Iranians have an, uh, you know, an advantage in terms of you know, they can continue uh, to poke at the U.S. presence in the Gulf uh, because they're fully aware that the American commander in chief will not be able to take any sort of retaliatory measures because of that very point that you raised? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, from a military perspective, uh, militaries generally, in my experience, uh, never want to go uh, into conflict unnecessarily. You know, we, we are always there as an insurance card. We are there if all other forms of dialogue have broken down and as Churchill famously said you know George or not war war uh, and Churchill was undoubtedly at heart a military man um, uh, so the military don't want to go into these conflicts but we want to make sure that if we go into them we know what we're going in for what are the objectives uh, and we know what are the aims that we need to achieve? What is it that our politicians want us to do? Um, so where you have somebody who waves a big stick about and says, you know, I my nuclear weapons are bigger than your nuclear weapons and, you know, I can beat you into... Um, uh, out, uh, you know, into uh, Armageddon, uh, and your country will not recover for many years, as he said to North Korea. You know, the military worry that a the country once once you know that this is an idle threat and it's not going to be carried out, then there is no point ever using that threat again. And actually, all that does is ratchet up tensions and uh, chaos until finally you do have to use the military option, um, however much you don't want to. But now you are several orders of magnitude more uh, intensely involved because 
you know, the the thing has been ratcheted up. The responses, uh, the the person has continued doing what in this case, the United States doesn't want to be done. And at the end of the day, some something has to be done. Now, we found that to a degree with in the Obama administration. Obama was, in again, instinctively against using warfare. Let's bear in mind the Americans have been very much bitten by their experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. They go in to do what they thought was a fairly limited action in Afghanistan, getting rid of the Taliban, and they are still in Afghanistan 16 years later. You know, it hasn't gone well for them. And, of course, this has huge implications for geostrategic policies uh, throughout the whole world. Two interesting things, I think, out of that, Pat, to perhaps... You know, go back a step with interestingly with Trump there's been some stuff written about his teenage years where his dad got totally sick of him being useless and sent him off to a military academy and there's been all sorts of interesting comments about that experience that one of the lessons he seemed to have learned out of that according to some of the people who taught him and who he was there studying with is he learnt that military appreciation of what the cost of war is in a way that most politicians no longer have. So it's interesting that when he is being belligerent, he understands the cost. But your second point, that also he talks big. He doesn't rattle the sabre in a military sense. He talks about the big deal, and he tries to apply pressure to get the outcome he wants. So it's a weird combination that maybe in some sense he does actually respect military personnel and it certainly seemed that was the case when he was interacting with Mike Flynn. But also it's the language of the street trader pushing for the best deal and these two things fit together really, it's very incongruous. The two things shouldn't fit together and therefore the mixed messages and the mixed metaphors means he's more of a wild card perhaps or we perceive him as more of a wild card than he actually is. Yes, I, I think that's I, I think that's right, and I think that he's he is finding now that geo strategy is not the same thing as doing a property deal. Uh, there may be some similarities at some very nefarious um, nebulous area, but. Generally speaking, they are like chalk and cheese. Mm. Now, he is experienced in property deals. The question of how successful he is is a totally different um, a different discussion. But um, he's, um, he's not – he doesn't understand the – and doesn't indeed like geostrategic norms. Uh, as he says – uh, you know, looking at globalization, it's over, he says. We are now individual nations pursuing individual national agendas. You know, make America great. He can quite empathize with President Xi when President Xi is effectively saying, make China great. You know, there's a similarity there. They can understand it. And so he doesn't like the ways and means. He doesn't like the United Nations. He doesn't like NATO. He doesn't like um, he doesn't like the European Union because he sees all of these as almost talking shops where nothing gets done. He's very Hobbesian. Because he sees everything almost as war of all on all, which is very yeah. much the conventional classical you know, liberal perspective of how an economy works. And yet we know that the opposite is true, that people do best when people work together. But it's like in real estate, they never got the memo. Is it also important to ask if there is a historical precedence of any other US president liking NATO or the United Nations? Is this different to anyone else? It doesn't seem to me that it is. Well, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that presidents have been previous presidents have been as dismissive as Donald Trump is towards NATO. Now, 
it is true to say that uh, since the 50s, as European nations' economies improved after, after the Second World War, American presidents have said there needs to be more burden sharing. And indeed, quite a lot of work was done uh, on this uh, in the 80s and 90s. It was a subject that came up at all the uh, NATO heads of uh, state meetings. But there was a view that, you know, NATO was the linchpin of American defence in Europe and defence towards the Soviet Union. So in answer to the question, they they may not have liked it, but they recognised what it could do for America and were prepared to work with it. They saw the strategic benefit of something to confront Russia. So whether they liked the situation or not, they could make use of the situation. So 1946, when they're busy knocking down factories in Germany and they realise, no, we can't turn Germany back into a pastoral state. We need a bulwark against Russia and West Germany is going to be it. So cold, hard pragmatics is something they had that at an absolute minimum Trump doesn't seem to have. Well, uh, also I think Trump has, uh, I mean, most politicians, we accuse most politicians of having very short time frames. And um, uh, Donald Trump has even shorter time frames, it seems to me. Mm. You know, he doesn't have any time for developing these long-term relationships. You know, he expects to be able to go sit down, meet his opposite numbers, get a deal, sign the deal, and things to be different. Whereas in reality, of course, it takes quite a long time to set the scene um, and to, to be able then to get things to, to move in the direction that you want them to move. Donald Trump's uh, behaviour, of course, has now set a precedent in terms of people know to expect the unexpected from him. So is that necessarily something that people will then now start expecting from him? So therefore, you know, the, the, there's a, a limit to how much you can push this before it becomes predictable. Like you can you can play the crazy guy in the room and eventually everyone around in the room is going to know that you're going to play the crazy guy. So once yeah, you play- Is it crazy the- or is it the worst outcome we can imagine? Because what we significantly get is not crazy. It's the worst geopolitical outcome we can imagine. Well, well, still, it's a predictable pattern of behaviour, right? So, in in effect, what is Trump's game plan? I mean, it's okay to say I'm going to apply all this pressure with the idea of creating a deal, but if the person you're trying to have a deal with is truly recalcitrant and doesn't want to play <laughs> by your rules, that means that you're at a massive disadvantage. Well, or they're a traditional diplomat who's looking to build a relationship so that there's some level of understanding. So it fails at both levels. Yeah, it does. So it's a problem. And look, you know, I mean, if you look at Iran, Iran is a country that is now hemmed in on both sides, both from the so-called Iraqi side and also the Afghan side. You've got the uh, US allies on the Gulf, uh, of, of the Gulf on the other side as well. So it is truly a country that's hemmed in with the maximum pressure being applied by the United States under the Trump administration, they're having fewer and fewer cards to play that could be considered diplomatic. So the only thing that they have now is the capacity to lash out and lash out in ways that remind the international community that, you know what, we may be a third-rate power, but we can strike out and we can cause havoc in the region where you know, the international commons would find it very difficult to deal with. But there's another side to this immediately, and that is if you've cornered anyone or anything to the degree Iran is now cornered, it's like you've got a hammer and you're seeing Iran as a nail. You're not giving them any choice but to lash out. No, exactly right. Um, I, I think this is a very dangerous situation to be in. Mm. And uh, obviously the uh, the strikes against the Quraysh and al Qaeda oil facilities in Saudi Arabia by assailants unknown, you know, that really does kind of raise the ante significantly. And I would suspect that the Iranians aren't in a hurry 
to to have a follow on push right now, what they'll do is they'll let everything simmer down for a couple of months or maybe a month, and then they'll ramp it up again. So it's one of those things where it ebbs and flows, not enough to cause the Americans, you know, uh, to have that 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 mindset of saying, well, we must mobilize our military forces and send them against Iran. It's just going to be enough to hurt the Americans, but not enough to push the Trump administration into an all-out war footing. What, what, what would you say to that, Pat? Well, I think that's in, entirely right. I, I think that in looking at what the Iranians will do next, yes, they are very much pushed into a corner. They've got very little to lose. They also, of course, um, Iran is too states in one, really. It's mm. both um, a um, government and a theocracy. And the two sides don't necessarily see eye to eye. And it depends who's in the ascendancy as to what actions are taken. So to some extent, predicting what's going to happen in Iran is difficult. But I think that John's right in looking at, you know, the attacks on the oil fields have succeeded almost beyond the Iranians' wildest dreams because it's it's thrown the Saudis into complete disarray. It has shown that the surround the Saudi highly expensive American uh, defense systems, are not invulnerable um, and that they haven't been able to cope with this particular form of attack. Um, it has also tweaked the American tale. I must be careful, you know, because one goes back to the 19th century analogies of um, the, the British lion's tale. But anyway, they, they've tweaked Uncle Sam and Uncle Sam has just sat there and said, well, we might have to increase sanctions, to which the Iranians say, well, go on, do it. I mean, how much more can you put sanctions on us? We're already mm. got almost as, you know, additional sanctions are not going to be effective. It's not going to materially affect the livelihood of the citizens of Iran. Um, so, you know, go on, do your worst. And you're certainly not going to attack us because you know that if you now attack us, you're going to have to do so seriously. One of the interesting things about uh, what you said just a moment ago is that Iran has many competing centers of power. You've got the government and you've got the theocracy. But you could even peel it back further and say you've got the Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is its own thing, runs its own black economy, can either favor a certain Ayatollah over another, depending on whatever hawkish mood happens to prevail in Tehran. So again, when we talk about the possibility of negotiating with an entity like Iran as it's currently constructed, what do we actually mean? I mean, would, it, would we need the Iranian President Rouhani to sit down at the United Nations and sign a form? Would that be good enough? Would that be considered good enough? Because yeah, how when many he goes, sides does it get on board? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when he goes home, he's going to have to be talking to his IRCG commanders, and they may be very unhappy with whatever this, you know, what Rouhani signed away. Is it Grand Ayatollah? Khamenei, does he have a say in all of this? He seems to be the power broker that manages to sort of do all the deal making in the Iranian sense, but he's old, he's frail, his power may be, you know, abating considering his age, and maybe the, you know, the Supreme Council is looking for a replacement at this point in time, which means that he's in a very weakened position uh, from a political perspective. So what do we mean by let's try let let Trump ex exercise maximum pressure on Iran? Who is it that we're trying to exercise maximum pressure against? Well, this and is with whom are we going to do the deal? This is the lack of sophistication in the coverage we get, yeah. is that we keep hearing the word, oh, we need to talk to Iran or Iran needs to comply mm. without the subtleties of, well, there's three Irans. And can you get the three to agree? Can you find someone who represents all of them? So this idea that it's a deal, no, it's not a deal. It is genuinely a diplomatic issue that requires multiple sides within Iran to be you know, engaged to try and find a compromise because the deal's not going to work. 
And and actually, this ambiguity is, I think, uh, an adva- uh, is an advantage to Iran mm. because it does make it extremely difficult to be able to bring any coordinated international view against Iran because each of the different bits of Iran have different supporters in the outside world. And if we add to that, we then have the fourth group in Iran – that are this mass of young, reasonably educated, sophisticated people who don't want to live under sanctions, don't want a war, but also don't necessarily want to be Western. They have no say, but they come across as being quite likable and reasonable people that no one is listening to. Unfortunately, they come from the city yeah. and, and the theocracy's power base is in the countryside. So the rural areas hold sway mm. in Tehran in a way which prevents having a, a proper... Uh, union of view between city and country. I mean, it's mm. uh, and, and arguably over the border in Turkey, it's exactly the same. If we're going to have a look at that as well. Yeah. So, Pat, one of the things that I was going to ask is, we mentioned the idea of you know the Saudis not getting a return on investment for the many billions of dollars of U.S. anti-aircraft, anti-ballistic missile systems uh, that they managed to buy and integrate within their armed forces. But considering the nature of the attack, uh, the Kureis oil field is near Riyadh, and you, you would expect that Kureis would have been a prime target mm. to defend from a Saudi perspective. But considering that the Saudis may or may not have properly used the weaponry that they received from the United States, right next door to Saudi Arabia is the US Navy's Fifth Fleet headquarters in Bahrain. Now, the U.S. does have the capacity to have satellite overwatch over that region. It still beggars belief that, I mean, you can believe that the Saudis couldn't detect the incoming missiles and drones, but the Americans surely, with the amount of technology that they have in overwatch over the Gulf, they must have seen something. Why do you think that there would have been a breakdown in communication between the U.S. Fifth Fleet headquarters and Riyadh? I suspect, and I know nothing more than I've read in uh, open source. So, you know, this is not uh, the result of of, uh, insider information. But I suspect that the uh, American uh, fleet is sitting there in its headquarters, fat, dumb and happy, and just isn't geared up for offensive operations. It's like Pearl Harbor, dare I say it. You know, it's it's this thing of, of feeling that you're safe at home with the doors locked and you are not going to be attacked. And it's, I mean, we watch too many Hollywood movies, you know, where all the information is out there and it all comes together and the hero of course is putting it all together and the 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 establishment whoever that may be um is is being quite slow but the hero comes and saves the day in the end um in real life that doesn't tend to happen what tends to happen is people get bored on watch or people are not looking for the right sort of things or people are not responsive enough Pearl Harbor was on a Sunday uh, when people were at church and, you know, they didn't expect that uh, the Japanese would uh, uh, attack over such a a huge um, expanse of ocean. And the same thing is true of people in the Gulf. You know, they're sitting there. They don't expect there to be an attack. And that's the whole purpose of a surprise attack. And... It will continue to work as long as human beings are human beings. But Pat, that's um, a that's an awfully shocking statement to make. No, it's not. It's well, not no, a no, sensible no, no, statement. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's true. a shocking statement to make for the audience who would probably think, "Well, hang on a tick." So, you know, the Saudis are buying billions of dollars worth of merchandise. They can't use it. They're complacent. Uh, the Americans are right next door. They're fat and happy, and they're not doing anything much because they're bored. You know, when you look at it from the outsider's perspective, you would have to think, my God, so what is all of this stuff in the Middle East all about? I mean, if everyone is just asleep at the wheel <laughs> and, and you know, the so-called Pearl Harbor moment is something that can be played on by a country like Iran, which is effectively a third world state taking on 
a great power and all of its allies, you know, it, it kind of is unsettling to hear this. No. Well, of, of course it is. Um, but the fact that it's unsettling doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It's historically uh, normal. Yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah, it was funny, Pat. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead. It's funny, Pat. As you were about to say Pearl Harbor, it was all I could think of because, uh, funnily enough, on this uh, whole Hollywood analogy, I watched Tora, Tora, Tora the other night, which is yeah. a 60, uh, I believe 60s mm-hmm. film, which uh, doesn't depict America as the heroes. And, of course, the quote at the end of that film is that uh, you know the Japanese awoke. They fear they awoke a giant, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. and I suppose you know maybe Americans haven't learnt their lesson because even after the surprise attack of something like Pearl Harbor, maybe if the same thing would happen from you know some uh, from a Gulf state, for instance, is it true that whatever attack that they could amount, ultimately America will well, prevail? Look at, look at nine eleven. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, but the Americans. Are, them, yeah, but they. The USS Cole. <laughs> mm, um, yeah, yeah, and Tanzania know, and you, Kenya, you, the embassies. You have these. Um, you have these units operating in what is ostensibly a period of peace. You know, you you can't. Uh, I mean, um, we have peacetime running and and operational running. Um, If I was the commander-in-chief out in in the Gulf, I would be keeping my my team at what are called defence watches, which is, you know, where you are much more aware of things happening. I wouldn't keep them at action stations because you can't do that for... It burns uh, more than a few hours, but you'd keep people at defence watches, and you would make sure that people recognise that that there is a threat, and it can. And look at it, HMS Cornwall. You know uh, when they were doing the um, the boarding of ships in the Gulf, and the uh, Iranian guard um, came down and captured the the ship's boat and held them hostages for several days. You know, these things happen, and you need to keep the the crews and your men up to speed in being able to respond to any threat that comes. Is it easy? No, it's not. Does it, um, uh, it, it... It's quite debilitating on manpower because you're constantly on edge and 99.9% of the time nothing happens. So is it pragmatic then to not be on edge but just be so well armed that no matter what attack you're faced with you can respond with uh, you know, uh, an exponential uh, an ex- exponentially you know a greater defense I suppose. But that's the point they are that well armed and they didn't respond and they can't respond that extremely. It has to be proportional. And if we look historically, the US Navy hasn't done much other than launch weapons from extended range for decades. The big discussion in the US Navy at the moment seems to be how unready they are for modern warfare in the same way that the US Army was unready for Iraq and Afghanistan. I think there's a lot to be said in that. You know, history of warfare tells us that, you know, we we operate, um, we, we go into a conflict or into a state of tension and suddenly we realise that people aren't, our opponents are not playing by the same book that we have trained all our forces on and we have to relearn the game. So in the Second World War, of course, it was blitzkrieg. You know, we didn't think that would happen. We'd learned the very expensive lesson in the First World War that, you know, you could have trench warfare and, and gas attacks and everything else. So we were we were ready for that. And indeed, you know, the French had created their Maginot line, which in in the event was completely useless because the Germans just went round it with Blitzkrieg. And if you are a, a, a potential aggressor, you will look at what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of your proposed potential opponent and make sure you go for the weaknesses. You're not stupid. 
And this is the Iranian um, advantage is they've been doing this nonstop since 1979. They are 40 yeah. years into being outgunned, undermanned, under-resourced and broadly hated. And so they have normalized adaptation in a way that I would argue basically no one but US Joint Special Operation Command. And JSOC only got there because they were losing in Baghdad and Stan McChrystal politely said, we are not winning. The, you know, the Iranians are better at this than any mass organization has been for well, centuries. You, they've, they've clearly read uh, one of the best books on military tactics I ever came across was a book called On the Psychology of Military Incompetence. <laughs> a chap called Norman Dixon. And he wrote this in the 1960s. It is still in print today. It, I have to say, it talks only about British military incompetence. And in the foreword, he says, this is not because other nations get it right. It's because I felt that there were so many examples in British military history um, that um, I would uh, use it, and it's for other people to look at Do incompetence the in their country. own way of doing it. Mm. And it's the same old thing that people always try to fight the last war. They don't look at how people might win the future war. And, you know, as you say, the Iranians have been in this position where they're the underdog, you know, they would say since 1979. Mm, And they they need to learn new ways of doing things. And they have done extremely well at learning new ways of doing things. So from, from a Western perspective, though, Pat, if, if I was just going to take the average Joe citizen's view and, you know, we get gazumped again, or at least the West gets gazumped again and its interests take a tumble, maybe there's another shoot down of a couple of American drones that happen to be straying a bit too close to Iran's border. Maybe there's another Iranian strike and, uh, I don't know, maybe another Gulf oil field, not necessarily Saudi Arabia, but elsewhere. Is it correct for the great unwashed out there to sit back and say, you know what, with all this technology, with all this stuff that we've got, shouldn't we have been better prepared? After all, we have invested so many billions of dollars in preparing for whatever the likely eventuality happens to be. I mean, who is going to be the one that gets brought to account? Um, and, And arguably, if... No one is brought to account. Obviously, we can slip into a major war very, very quickly. Yeah, but major wars happen by accident, particularly in the Gulf. This is the whole point. Was it 2008 that someone in the Emirates says no one in our region should have nuclear weapons because it's too likely to turn into a disaster? Yeah, this is why we look at this region and go, oh, crap, <laughs> because the tensions are so high and the simmer point is so high. Sorry, Pat, I didn't give you a chance to talk. No, 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 don't. I mean, I think that we it's almost inevitable that uh, we will be caught on the hop again. Um, we have uh, institutional militaries. We have uh, rules of engagement that are laid down by our political masters. Quite rightly, uh, it says how we determine things. We have uh, international institutions like uh, the Red Cross, like the United Nations, that even lay down uh, the, the law of war and says that these are the ways that we, as ostensibly civilized people, are going to conduct things. But you will then get people like ISIS coming along and they don't worry about the laws of war. They don't worry about the the rights of prisoners of war. Um, If they want to put um, videos of uh, beheading prisoners, um, they'll do so. Um, And we have to learn how to live with this because one of the things we don't want to do as, you know, civilised people is to adopt their way of fighting. Now, 
you can say, well, then in which case we'll never win. Well, I'm not sure that's true. Well, I think that it'll take us a lot longer and we'll have to be a lot cleverer about the way we uh, employ all the resources um, at, at our command, whether they be unmanned drones or whether it be cruise missiles or whether it be... Uh, you know, cyber warfare, we're going to have to look right across the whole spectrum and try to integrate it in a much more coherent manner. And at the moment, you know, we still have in in the UK, and I know it's the same in America, and I know it's the same in Australia, you have the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force and if you're an army officer, the thing you really need is more tanks. If you're the Navy, you want, you know, more submarines. And if you're the Air Force, you want more complex fighter aircraft. And, you know, that in a sense is is inevitable. But we need to learn how to integrate this a lot more coherently. Pat, I was just wondering, in your opinion, do you think that Trump walking away from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or JACPOA was the thing that got us to this very uncomfortable situation? Do you think that we could have handled things a bit more differently in terms of how, you know, the United States would have gone ahead with trying to renegotiate aspects of JACPOA? And do you think that the Iranians really wanted to nego- renegotiate it because it, effectively it was something for them to bring their nuclear developments to a halt. But now Trump wants it to rein in Iranian proxies around the Middle East. It wants to be something that caps missile development in Iran. You know, two of, the, two of uh, Iran's greatest strategic trump cards, if you will. What, what, are your, what are your views on this whole renegotiation of a treaty that by all international standards was going swimmingly well until Donald Trump decided to pull out of it last year? Well, um, I mean, that's the, that's the whole thing, isn't it, really? Um, if you think of yourself as an Iranian at the moment and um, you've been forced into a corner and you have agreed a treaty with the great Satan and a number of lesser Satans, um, and you are, through gritted teeth, um, making sure you stick to the terms of that treaty. And then the great Satan says, I don't like this treaty, I'm tearing it up, and I'm going to put more sanctions on you. Are you going to have confidence that any new treaty you um, manage to extract from the great and lesser Satans is going to be any more viable than the last one? Absolutely. Uh, David, what do you think? No, it's just it confirms Iran's view of the world literally since the early 50s when the CIA and MI6 destroyed attempts to nationalise oil. Everything has been the same path towards none of the Satans can be trusted. And being now halfway through Seth Abraham Abramson's book, Proof of Conspiracy, it's quite clear that the Arab states, the Israelis and the Russians have come up with some sort of compromise to support Trump, believing they could get a belligerent president who would get rid of their Iranian problem. And we're probably very lucky, actually, that he is loud, but not as belligerent as the Arab world, Russians and Israelis hoped he would be. Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think that's, I think that's true. I think that the, um, you know, the the advantage is that Trump is even more unpredictable than some of the uh, players thought that he was going to be. Um, and um, uh, as you say, thank heavens for that, because. Uh, I think that they hoped that they were going to be able to uh, get him to do everything at his at, at their bidding, and that he was going to be, you know, they could light the blue touch paper, and Trump would cause the chaos. I mean, he's causing quite a bit of chaos, but he not the chaos has, they wanted, has, but not the chaos they wanted, mm. and you know, we have to. You know, this is a, uh, this is a, one of those fundamental issues. Is you have to realise that 
there is there are other agendas here other than those set by the West. We haven't mentioned China yet. China has got um, a long term agenda uh, and and is doing really quite well at making sure its agenda is um, is fulfilled. Um, the the Russians have an agenda of a of a type. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm slightly less sanguine about the uh, the vision of the Russians. I think that the Putin is just at the moment is trying hard to stay on his bicycle mm. uh, because I think he is very worried about the way things are going domestically. Mm. And that should worry us as well, because, of course, the tr- traditional way of a dictator when domestic things are not going going well is to look outside your own national borders and create chaos and mayhem. And we have to wonder if it will be the same for China with the problems caused because of Hong Kong. Yes. The external adventure for both the Russians and the PRC gets more and more appealing. And if what we're seeing, if Seth Abramson is right, that in 2015 there was a deal between major Arab states with the Israelis knowing the deal was going on, the Russians knowing the deal was going on, to try and get Trump to help them solve their Iran problem, and yet the Arab world can't even sort out its Yemen problem with zillions of dollars worth of high-tech kit that they're thus far not able to use effectively... We're back to the normal case of America, come fix this for us, blow up our enemy. Well, the Americans are so gun-shy of that after Afghanistan and Iraq that maybe people will keep giving Trump advice that immaterial of how hawkish politicians in Washington want to be, hopefully people in uniform keep saying, this would be demented, this would be awful, how long do you want to be there for, how much of a mess do you want? Speaking of that very point, though, so now that we don't have John Bolton as Trump's national... Can we please clap for that? We don't have John Bolton. Well, we don't have John Bolton as Trump's national security advisor. That was a net gain for Trump's national security inner circle? What's a net gain for the world? (laughs) Was he that bad, really? (laughs) He was the last PNAC man standing, well, in Trump's inner circle. Yeah, that's true. But considering the fact that we we spent a fair bit of this time looking at the unpredictability of Donald Trump, w- would Bolton have been considered a voice of common sense, although very much in the PNAC method of common sense, like bomb them, bomb them all? Yeah, but there's no common sense in bomb them, bomb them all. <laughs> well, he would have been something that, you know, the peaceniks within the White House would have what been able peaceniks? to... Well, you know, they're, they're people who don't want to necessarily go all out. Yeah, is that peaceniks or people sane enough to know that violence has a cost? Well, that's a good question. And I that's don't a, think it's that's about peace. It's about question. recognising that violence has a cost. Mm. So, okay, if violence has a cost... The Iranians are prepared to continue to be... No choice. Well, that's right. There's no choice. So where, again, do we end up having a negotiated settlement? And what would that look like? With who? As we said, with, with which Iranians? Well, with who, but under, yes. what con- under what conditions would we be able to sit down with somebody <coughs> from that regime? Maybe an oil price of $150 a barrel because two more oil fields have been hit. And Turkey goes think- stuff that we're not going to pay and starts buying Iranian oil. Yeah. What do you think you, you could put in Iran to disturb the theoc- theocratic foundation? Um, what do you think that you could do to, to unsettle that? Nothing, um, because it's not the foundation, the revolutionary guard of the foundation. Well, there is something that can be done, and that, that is something that we haven't spoken about, and that is um, you know, continue with backing internal unrest in Iran. I mean, that would, that would allow the IRCG to have two enemies, an external one and an internal one. And okay, they've got the besiege as their auxiliaries, but they're really thugs uh, thugs and thongs. And Mm -hmm. whether or not they could stay on top of all the major cities rebelling against the theocracy at the same time, that would be an interesting thing to see. Again, it wouldn't be a welcome development, but certainly if you're looking at trying to apply pressure where pressure would hurt the most, in in particular with the IRCG and its architecture, I think you'd have to look at trying to foment some sort of internal revolt. Mm. And there are enough Iranians out there who are heartily sick of the regime. 
I mean, there's mm. there's poverty on the streets of Iran. Drug abuse is through the roof. You know, I mean, they're getting Cheap all their heroin best. from Afghanistan. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say they yeah. get all their Afghanistan uh, Afghan heroin uh, coming in. But that's that. You know, that's that's the balm of the young people at the moment because you know they they have a very stark choice: support the regime, get press ganged into service to defend the Ayatollahs, or just stay at home and 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 resent everything. And so, so even if. Even if you weren't to apply more pressure in that place, would it eventually just generationally bleed out? Well, or do you might. find that, or do you, would you find that the theocracy would just stay well within the elite and just okay. look? I, I think that there's a possibility that it could just bleed out. You know, after mm. a while, there is a sense of weariness, even with regard to a an autocratic structure. You know, mm. there's only mm. so much mm. that they can put in before entropy happens yeah, eventually. Absolutely, but again, by pushing now, you give entropy no chance. Mm. when entropy is probably the only thing that will slow the Iranians. Because as we've pointed out, we've thrown away any sensible levers mm. to ask for better behaviour. And the last thing you want to do is set up a situation where the exact opposite of what you want happens. And that is that even though the people of Iran are jaded by the Ayatollahs, they end up rallying around the flag. Because the world has treated them so poorly absolutely. as a country, okay, which is so where we're heading towards. So yeah. you would still find that, you know... Uh, America is Satan, effectively, if, yeah. even if they yeah, were to wrap around the, cool the flag. Aid. Yeah, mm. okay. And that's mm. the Kool-Aid they've been fed their whole lives. And they may not want to believe it, but when the West behaves like this, mm. why not believe it? It, it just seems that the 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 re- religious basis of that is far stronger than perhaps the uh, you know, emotional reaction to a flag. Yeah, all. but even at it to more than religion, it's the practical implications of all these things I mean you've got a uni degree and the only fun thing in your day is heroin mm. Mm. That's well, right. that sounds like a good time to me <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're, you're down with the blue hair. Yeah, Sorry. Right. yeah. Okay. Well, no. Now I'm painting, up that one. painting a bad image of myself. Sorry, Pat. That was <laughs> so anyway, from from the military perspective, finally, I'd like to look at the presence of Western forces in the Gulf. Now, there have been a number of articles, and I think I flicked a few of them to you, Pat, with regard to the Royal Navy and its incapacities in being able to extend itself because. Basically, there's no money in the kitty, there's chaos in London, there's a whole heap of things that are mitigating against Britain, portraying itself as a, well, a a relatively senior sheriff to the United States uh, anywhere in the world right now. How do you see Britain extending itself into the Gulf, giving America a a helping hand against, against the Iranian regime? Well, you're right, uh, and and some of the articles that uh, I've seen are, are, are very right about the uh, power, the current power of the Royal Navy. I mean, one of the uh, fundamental principles, if you like, of uh, running a navy is a ship can only be in one place at one time, and that the sea is a very large place. I mean, you know, we tend now to look at the Middle East and think, well, you know, okay, I can see it on the globe and it's there and it's not very big. Uh, But actually, when you've got one ship in the middle of the Arabian Sea or in the uh, Gulf of Hormuz, it's still quite a big area. You know, we have one of the problems that that we had uh, when we had what were called the Cod Wars, the Icelandic Cod Wars in the 60s. You know, we now have these amazingly capable ships that can shoot down missiles and aircraft and whatever, and they're all lethal. You know, it's a bit like Australian snakes. You know, Mm. 90% of them are venomous and the other 10% are deadly. Mm. (laughs) You know, and and the the whole issue is that in the Cod Wars, if we wanted to put a shot across uh, a trawler's bow... We could blow it out of the water, but we didn't have anything just to put a shot across the bow. You can't go down to the scale of the conflict. Our ships are almost too sophisticated Mm. to do the job we really want them to do. Mm. And the area is too large. And and, uh, I must say, you know, the Royal Navy is actually trying to produce some Uh, slightly cheaper ships so we can have slightly more of them. Um, But we do have to try to get um, 
dare I say it, a, a coalition of um, powers who are prepared to work together. So there are quite a few ships in the world in different navies and what we've got to be able to do is to agree on a limited number of actions that these navies collectively and collaboratively can do uh, that's one of the advantages of course of of having uh, organizations like NATO because we're used to working together so you could take NATO nations you can put a uh, a force together, in this case of a uh, maritime force, and they will know what to do instinctively. They're trained to work together. You can you can command them as a unit. A bit oh. more difficult when you have, you know, nations from outside that sort of collaborative area. But that's what we need to do it's, to it's, be able to bring a national international grouping together. Slightly uh, counter-piracy missions that uh, took place off the yeah, coast of Somalia. Somalia. Same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there, of course, you had Chinese working with Danish and mm. British working with, you know, uh, Malaysian. I mean, it was a, a complete agreement. And, and actually, they were pretty effective. Mm. So I think they need to bring that sort of approach to be able to, you know, at the end of the day, the only way you're going to change things in the Middle East is for those nations to realize that they are acting completely outside the norms of every other nation. But at the moment, you don't have that because, the, you know, every nation has got supporters from around the world who are sticking their oar in. And we tolerate poor behaviour because of oil. Yes, yeah, mm. we do. <laughs> it's that simple, sadly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Pat, well, I think that that's a wrap. Gentlemen, is there anything that you would like to say as your final observation? Um, I'll, st I'll start off with Pat, shall I? Pat? Uh, yeah, just as long as you don't ask me anything about Brexit, I'm uh, quite happy to uh, talk about anything. Oh, uh, look, uh, Pat, we're going to we're going to reserve Brexit for another podcast closer to the <laughs> event. <laughs> You've been warned, <laughs> David. If we're talking about Brexit, I'm bringing a hammer so I can hit the nail. <laughs> Tim. Um, I, I have I have no comments other than that I, I thought the you never no, thought I just don't, I have no have no comments there uh, except, except to rescind my heroin addiction. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> dye your hair back to pink and yeah. you'll be fine. Yeah, it's it's okay. all about going blue when you're pink. You are such a civilized dude. Yeah. <laughs> the masks we wear. Yeah. Indeed. All right. Well, thank you very much, Pat, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here, and uh, your comments were, as always, are appreciated. <laughs> Delighted. All right. Hey, take care. You too. Thank you, Thanks, thank you Pat. Pat. Bye. Bye. And thank you very much, David, for joining us. Thank you, Tim and John and Pat. And thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everyone. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to Strategicon through the Ozcast network, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. Please like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. Also, please comment on any of our articles and podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, on the Sage International Australia site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. Until next time, goodbye. We love the Employee Retention Tax Credit and what it does for clients. Find out if you qualify at iHeartTaxRefunds.com. As the first and only CPA firm in the country solely offering ERC services, JWC has helped thousands of businesses claim over $500 million in tax refunds. We're a licensed and regulated CPA firm committed to client education without the gimmicks and deception of unlicensed ERC companies. Learn how to qualify at iHeartTaxRefunds.com. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.